here's the fan box with the fan and the Versa Ohm mounted on it. And my purpose here is just sh to show you some of the design uh, concepts that went into it. I'm going to turn off the fan uh, just because we know what's hanging out there now so we can see what's going on there. The fan, these holes are tapped for the fan. We have a jack for our 12 volt supply and I decided to make this out of 1 16th and 1 8th ABS. And the 1 8th is for a sturdier bottom for everything to mount to and also the fan is also also one eighth material and then the rest of its one sixteenth uh, I figured this was probably the easiest way to make this uh, they'd be reasonably easy to produce in the small numbers that I'm going to be making them in and uh, I'm just going to show you some of the design details that went into this here I've made uh, most of the pieces transparent so we can see the construction and we'll zoom in here and you can see that we've got tabs in this top part that allow us to uh, have the top located we have tabs here in the back on the flange for the fan on both sides and we have tabs in here that locate the baffle that uh, makes the um, air run up through the, the heat sinks uh, you can see here how they're, they're milled in there. We have slots here along there. And this just locates everything so that um, gluing this together will not be a, a major hassle. So that's the, uh, the general concept of that. Here we have a cross section showing the airflow from the fan being neck down to come down under this lip, up through. The baffle is here to force the air to come up through the heat sink and back out through. If we didn't have this baffle here the air would just freely run underneath and wouldn't be forced to go up through and actually uh, get the maximum amount of contact through the fins of the heat sink. Here is a view looking through the heat sinks and the walls and you can see that we've constricted the air to go just in the area where the heat sinks are and we've tried to keep a reasonably even uh, gap around the heat sinks and if we zoom in here we can see that the heat sinks are actually one side of them is actually touching the flattened mill max connector and then these are the actual surface mount resistors and this left side in this particular um, instance is the actual surface that has the resistive uh, film on it so the heat sink has a, a very small gap with the uh, thermal uh, high thermal conductivity epoxy and a little in, two little insulating strips of uh, nylon filament to keep it from contacting so this is very directly getting to the heat on the actual film side and then on this side we're taking the heat um, from the uh, that's conducted through the pins from the solder joint through the pins and then through the uh, heat sink uh, or high conductivity epoxy into the heat sink so we're getting both sides of this and of course the aluminum is carrying the heat out here to where we can get to it here's one of the advantages of when you're using solid modeling is the ability to just get these cross sections that fit exactly where the piece is going to hit the part and design it such that I can still do it with a 1 16th end mill and have everything cut um, through the whole shape of the piece without any um, other machining necessary Another example here with the intermediate uh, divider where we are able to come in here and go around the vinyl caps, come up in between, form a resting ledge. But you see here that I undercut with the 16th end mill so that I didn't have to come back and do any kind of sharp, sharp corner treatment. And here are the slots that align the uh, baffle that brings the uh, air up through the, the heat sinks. So by designing all the parts in context like this, it's easy to get things that fit and uh, work properly. And all these pieces are then turned into uh, drawings with dimensions 
that you'll see that I use to program the CNC to do all the shapes. I'm cutting pieces for the fan box out of the 1 16th ABS and I'm using the shear and with the shear I've made a fence on the left side in between the blade which makes it easy to set your actual width of cut that you want to make and constrains it. So I'm using an adjustable parallel here. I'm after a 1.770 uh, width of, of cut. So with the blade down I can come in and set this, snug the stop here, check down at this end, make sure it's actually parallel. Slide up to this end, make sure that we're actually getting a good seat on the blade there. And then we'll just lock these up. And that's lets us set the actual width that we're after. By doing this backwards, we can put our piece in, come in, put our pressure bar on, keep the plastic from buckling, which it likes to do. Put our clamps, modify the clamp to be able to reach under and uh, get a hold of the the plastic, reach in seat firmly on each end, and then we just cut plastic, remove these, and we should be pretty close. The whole object here is to not have to machine these. One point within thousandth, two thousandths, which is plenty good enough for what we're doing here. These will get cut crosswise later to get cut into this shorter segments, but that just shows how we can do some precise cutting on the shear to minimize uh, the amount of milling that we have to do on the edges for our finger grooves. And now cross cutting these strips that we cut to width to the opposite dimension. Same thing on the stop. Flipping the pieces every other cut or every cut in order to, if there's any minute angle difference on these, this shiny side up, now we'll put the hair cell side up. That's if there's any uh, out of parallelism here, it won't walk its way around and end up being way out of square by the time you get to the end of your last piece. Here are our shapes that have been sheared. Some have to get milled, some are ready to go as is. They all have their particular grooves and things and edge treatments that will allow them to nest together easily and uh, glue together without a lot of hassle and also make for stronger joints. And these have all the dimensions that I need to program in the CNC on the drawing so that I can quickly program them. Here I'm making a fixture plate with a grid pattern of tapped holes and dowel holes to be able to position the ABS plates in different locations and have different clamps and do it with all of them. There's a sacrificial plate on the bottom there with the centerpiece from the last part taken off. That's to keep the end mill protected from not having to go down into the steel. It's tightened up. The dowel pins located it to make sure we have a consistent amount of material to remove on each uh, side. Doing the periphery, this is an O-flute cutter, single lip cutter specifically designed for cutting ABS. Now we're cutting a tap hole. These are the slots for the tabs. Another tap hole for the fan. Another tap hole, the other slots. And the last tap hole. Now we're cutting the inner hole out and I am a trained professional. Do not do this at home, holding the piece so that it gets finished on the outer edge. Here I'm doing the base plate, milling the periphery. We have two sets of clamps on. We grip from one side, do what we can from the one side. These are the alignment slots for the pieces to go in. Now we'll slide the other clamps in before we loosen the others. 
so that we maintain position and we come down put the slots in on the edge that we were holding on and we come around and we mill the periphery release those put a new piece in use dowels to locate again to position the parts for the uh, location and ready to go tapping the holes in the flange for the fan to screw to this piece only needs three sides machined so it can be done with a single clamp doing the slots first and then doing the periphery and then it's complete another piece that accessed from one side and uh, you can see how this fixture plate makes doing all these a lot easier by being able to just pick spots and clamp locations that allow you to get access to the piece. Here we have another part where the whole periphery has to be cut using the dowel pins to align the part, putting the first clamp on to remove the dowels so we can do part of the periphery. As soon as the end mill is out of the way, we put the other clamp on to clamp it, pause the machine, remove the other clamp, finish the other side. This piece only has two edges milled, so we can grab from the center, mill one edge, put the tabs on one side, tabs on the other. This piece has all but one edge done, uh, so we can clamp it from one side and do the whole thing. Milling the edge with the tabs, do the end, then we come in and do the hole for the power jack. This is a piece with full periphery done. Dowel pins in to locate, clamp from one side, do the slots for the baffle, come down and do the periphery that we can access in the tabs from this side, move the clamp in for the remove the other one so that we have can access the other side, and we do the entire contour there. This is a similar piece to the last one, same procedure and everything, just has a little bit different contour. Uh, the O-Flute cutter uh, really works excellent on this plastic as you can see and uh, so this is the exact same procedure just a different shape here are all the parts for 12 boxes they all have their tabs ready to assemble material together with uh, MEK and I just gathered up a bunch of the chips from uh, the milling operations put them in here to just give this little body and to make it black but really the MEK by itself works just fine on the uh, on the ABS so we're starting with just putting a the corner piece in our one end piece putting our glue down put a fillet on either side the MEK attacks the ABS very quickly just get a little squiggle to to make it um, sit in and put a block in there to let it dry let that sit with the block holding it square as we start on another one and that's it same thing with the next vertical slide it in we get both sides with adhesive this time Just give it a little squirm to get it to bite put our block on to square it up and that's it You may be wondering how I keep this thing from clogging 
since the MEK and the plastic uh, dry so quickly. I have a 20 thousandths ID nozzle and I have a piece of 18 thousandths music wire. So this forms the cap and the cleaning tube. So when you're done with this, I use this as my stopper and it also allows you, if you let it sit too long and it starts to dry, it less allows you to uh, clean out the port. Here we're doing the next side. lock just holds it square while it sets so that they don't dry out of position. Move on to the next. Here are the pieces of the fan assembly for the Bursa Ohm. Uh, this is the fan ready to attach. We have the tapped holes in the flange, the connector for the 12 volt uh, supply, and we have a grill for the back of the fan. And this basically just directs the air down through, forces it to go up through the heat sink of the Bursa Ohm. The Versa Ohm just drops right on here. Uh, if you put it on the right direction, drops right on. As you can see through here, you can see the heat sink. This forces the heat sinks to be uh, the air to be forced to go through them, not just around them on the periphery. Fan connection. I've chosen to not use a switch but to just plug the unit in to turn the fan on and that's the noise level that you're hearing which is not too bad and now we're forcing air through the uh, reverse on